My name is Daphne Jones, and I am the CEO of a startup company called The Board Curators. I'm on the board of several public companies, and I'm a retired uh, IT executive. Daphne, thanks so much for making time to join us on the IB Podcast today. I'm very excited about the conversation that you and I had planned and talk about all the great things that you're currently building. But before we do that, give us a thumbnail version of your career prior to this. Sure. I started my career back in the day uh, when uh, the first PC was actually introduced to the world. I joined uh, IBM uh, as a systems engineer and also a sales rep a uh, long time ago and uh, moved my way through the, the corporation of IBM uh, to the, the point of being a manager. And then I moved on to other companies such as Johnson & Johnson uh, when I discovered through the, the, the bad health of my mother and father that if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. So I decided to switch my career from being involved in technology for technology's sake to actually applying it in a healthcare setting. So I served in IT for all of my career, however, in mostly healthcare companies such as Johnson & Johnson, Hospira, which uh, was an infusion technologies and pharmaceutical company that was sold to Pfizer several years ago. And then my final role and, and company I was with was GE Healthcare, where the manufacturer of MRIs, CAT scans, uh, et cetera, all those things that help people uh, live longer and be healthier. And so I retired from there uh, about 2017, 2018, and I have since then gotten the opportunity to serve on three public boards. One is a healthcare company, uh, AMN Healthcare. We are the nation's largest staffing organization where we staff um, doctors and nurses and other critical care uh, uh, people to work on with patients. Uh, the second one is Barnes Group. We are a 165-year-old aerospace company and, and also an industrial company. And then finally, but not least, is Masonite International. We are the world's largest door designer, distributor, manufacturer of, believe it or not, doors that are extremely important in our lives, whether there be front doors, back doors, inside doors, et cetera. I never realized how important doors were until the COVID crisis came and people realized, oh my goodness, I need these doors to help keep the sound out or keep my family safer now that we're all at home and all those things. So that's, that's my career. And then I started a company several years ago when I realized how difficult it was for people of color, women, uh, those people that are typically overlooked and undervalued and not the traditional uh, pedigree that you are traditionally seeing boards uh, consist of. And I created this company to help curate people to being board ready. Uh, so that's my background. I'm a grandmother of two, a, a mother of four. Uh, yeah, you know, the grandkids are only a year old or and one is uh, five months old. So a new grandma. Um, and uh, I live in Miami and I live in New York. Well, that's super exciting. What a background. And there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm very excited about the different direction of the, where we can take this conversation, especially with what you're currently building with your organization, with getting you know the individuals ready for the board opportunities and things like that. So maybe tell us a little bit more about this. What was the mission there? How did you go about just getting this started? And what were some, what, what, is, the, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with the current company? Well, let me start with the problem. Um, the problem is when you look at companies, the role of the board is to provide governance, oversight, perspective, to make sure that the companies that are under their charge are doing really well in the marketplace and driving shareholder value. Many of us own stock in you name it, whether it be Tesla or Johnson & Johnson or whatever. And we want those companies to do well and to return us, whether it be dividends or a higher share price. Well, the amount of challenges that companies have today, whether it be supply chain disruption, you know, the great resignation or attrition, if you look at social media, crisis communications, look at Delta, Look at uh, Disney when they're, you know, doing things that are getting them attention on social media. 
Um, there's issues with with uh, climate change, you know, ESG. There's issues with cybersecurity, digital transformation, you name it. And so, no longer can we have the same old homogeneous set of leaders that are driving board uh, leadership as we used to have in the past. It used to be the same white guy that would be the, the chairman of the board and the head of these committees, and that's who would join the board. Well, recently uh, with the uh, emergence of the San Francisco or the California uh, guidelines, many more states and more companies in those states are saying we need to have a diverse group of people sitting at the board table because of all these issues that boards are facing. You just can't have a homogeneous folks that pretty much know the same thing. So now we have CIOs that need to be part of boards because of the, the, the challenges with cybersecurity or the opportunity to grow digitally or drive the transformation. Uh, you actually need people who are chief marketing officers who may not have been always on the board, but when you look at supporting and getting with the customer, customer intimacy, making it more sticky, you need more HR people with the great resignation, legal with M&A, the more and more folks than companies that are not growing organically, but are growing through M&A. So having lawyers that specialize in some of these things that allow companies to grow is important. So my company, Board Curators, is solving the problem of driving more, more capability into the boardroom. So now we just don't find the person who is a woman. We just don't find the person who is an African-American who can work on and, and talk about DEI in a addition to their other superpowers, now you have to get them ready. They're used to being an operator, making decisions as a company leader. Now they don't make those decisions as a board member, we provide perspective. So our job is to train those leaders so that they now have the board mindset and not just an operations mindset, but they certainly come to the table with an operator's perspective. They've done the work, uh, but now they have to be trained to think more like a board member and understand what the purpose of the boards really are. So that's the that's the uh, thing of the company. And we do it with the online services and we do it with one-on-one -on -one coaching and we do live programs. Uh, we just did one for a trillion dollar company a, a couple of weeks ago. And we do a, an online, a, a live session where people have the opportunity to uh, learn in a cohort setting where they learn with each other as well. That's super exciting. And I definitely want to double click on a lot of those things that you told us about what you're currently building, primarily because for selfish reasons, I've just like yourself, I've been a technology executive at Fortune 500 for many, many years. And the transition I've made going from the corporate into startup world, uh, where I had built multiple startups, I successfully failed a lot of them. Um, and a couple <laughs> of them were successful and now transitioning more into that board member investor type uh, professional utilizing the experience that I went through myself. But I would imagine that a lot of other individuals take different paths and getting to the board opportunities. So maybe from your perspective, share with us a little bit more insight from a standpoint of what are the most common misconceptions that perhaps, you know, just, you know, just maybe mid-level professionals have as they grow through the ranks in their careers and they get to a point where they think they're ready for board opportunities like this um, and provide an oversight, the overall direction of the organization. Maybe share some insight from that standpoint and what are some of the things to consider as you try to embark on that journey maybe early on so that you, you, you don't make the same mistakes as others have. So would be curious to get your perspective on that. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I believe that there's three phases to, to our lives. First, you learn all you can, then you earn all you can, then you return all you can. And so that learning is when you're gathering intellectual capital, you're just scooping it up like Pac-Man does, just scoop up. Um, and then you're gathering it all. And then you take that intellectual capital and you trade it for financial capital, and that's where you earn all you can. And so, when you are in at the ready for board service, I believe that's when you are taking your intellectual capital and your financial capital, and you're now using that to return to society 
what it is that you have learned and what it is that you have earned. As a board member, I am in that returning phase right now where I am using all of the mistakes that I made, you know, the, the knowledge that I gathered uh, in corporate America, and I'm now returning that to the company so now the company can thrive. So first you have to understand, well, why are you interested in board service. You just don't say, I want to do it because I want to make a lot of money. Well, first of all, you got to get a tax advisor because when you get paid to be on a board, some of that, a lot of that stock option that you get is immediately taxable. And so you may not be rich right away because you have to pay taxes all the time, but you got to know why you're doing it. Are you doing it because you want to return or are you doing it because you want to earn or are you doing it because you want to learn? One of the reasons I never thought I would be on a board of a door company. Um, I never thought that that would be of interest to me, but I'm learning a ton about what is going on in the building industry, the renovation industry, and obviously the construction industry. So I'm learning a, a lot. So you got to be clear on what it is that you want to do. Number two, you have to be uh, to say that this is something that you want to do. You have to decide that you want to be on a board and that you have the support from your boss to be on a board. I remember when I was working at GE and I got offered an opportunity to work on a utility company board out West, they said, no, you can't. And the reason why they said no was because we're gonna need you probably at some point at the same day, the same time that this board might need you. And then who, who are you gonna to listen to? Who are, you going to? who are you going to work with? So you have to make sure that you've got the support that you need. Another thing to consider is like, what industry? You know, um, I was I was offered an opportunity to be on a cannabis board industry, uh, cannabis board, and my husband is a pastor of a church, and it would have been quite fascinating for me to be on a board of a marijuana company while my husband was <laughs> preaching about drugs. So you've got to understand what it is that you want to do, and then understand what your lines of demarcation are in terms of what kind of board. You know, I would not work on on a board uh, like that. So uh, those are some of the examples. And, and then finally, you have to know that you're not an operator anymore. You are in there to provide perspective. There's something that we talk about called noses in and hands off. So you can poke around and ask all kinds of questions, get, you know, be nosy and get your nose in inside, but you cannot point and say, I want you to do that. I want you to do that. That's what the management team is for. And our job is to make sure that they're doing their job well. If the CEO is out of line, we handle CEO succession. Um, we handle the external auditor. But for the most part, we are just really asking questions to ensure there's integrity of the financial statements, make sure that we're not taking undue risks. How do we deploy capital? Um, but they are asking for our input and our approval, but we are not actually operating the company. So those are some misnomers people might uh, might have. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, and much more, because I was trying to ca capture some notes as you were talking, especially some <laughs> of the metaphors that you use. Those are incredible. It makes, it makes such complex uh, strategies like this to comprehend in a, in a very efficient manner. So I definitely appreciated that. So you've mentioned you're also on the board of a door company. And... It begs a question, at least for me personally, I'm on the boards of only technology startups because that's my forte, because I know I bring value there. My role is very specific there. So I was always very intentional with the types of companies, the boards that I joined or the companies that I advise, or at least as a board observer. But from a diversification perspective, it never was an intent for me or even, even a consideration to join a board of a company that doesn't fit kind of the, the mold that I'm used to, mainly because I may have, you know, I, I was thinking that my career is all technology, is startups, is tech investments, those things. So I have to build a profile. I have to build a portfolio of board member with a track record of only technology companies. What was your rationale in terms of diversifying, going outside of your maybe, you know, the industries that you used to play with? Um, tell me a little bit more about that process and what was the, some of the expectations that came out of that? Yeah, well, if you if you look at uh, what Jeff Immel used to say when he was a CEO of GE, you, you go to bed as a door company 
and then you wake up as a as a technology company, or you go to bed as a healthcare company and you wake up as a technology company. And so uh, the companies that are the incumbent manufacturing industry based organizations, they should all be, you know, digital companies today. And so uh, in a way, it's not that much different. Uh, the work that I did and the other companies, I used to work for IBM, uh, certainly a technology company, but then I went to work for a healthcare company and the move to become data-driven, to use artificial intelligence, um, to be able to, to drive deep learning and, and to be able to use cyber um, digital in, in, in many new ways, that makes every company that I'm on the board of they want to do those things. And so now they're a technology company. They're a digital company that just happens to manufacture stuff. They're a digital company that just happens to cure, you know, certain diseases or staff organizations, staff hospitals with certain kinds of people. And so I think uh, as long as you can use business terms, as you describe what your value is, everybody's got a superpower. And the question is, how do you take that superpower translate that superpower into a way that will help that company, whether it's a, a traditional manufacturing company or a services company, or if it's a technology, traditional technology company, all of those companies want to drive market share. They want to have profitable growth, right? They want to have low uh, expenses, low attrition, and be industry leaders. So how does our superpower enable our company to be able to do the things that they want to do to be able to thrive. So I don't really try to make a distinction between a pure tech company and a, and a company who has become recently digitalized um, because every, you know, if I could, if I could tell every CEO what to do, I would say, take your smartest technology person and make them the CEO or make them the COO because it's really the, 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 these CIOs and CDOs and CTOs, they know how to take technology and make it sing to drive value for the companies. And uh, when, unfortunately, right now, a lot of the tech stocks are down and it's making people say, oh, so that tech phase is over. We don't have to be digital anymore. We, you know, it's not going to matter. And it does matter and it will matter. Um, you know, Tesla is a true manufacturing company. They're a technology company, rather, that happens to manufacture or, or assemble parts of cars. But the technology company and I think Elon Musk, I'll call him the CIO of the company. And as a CIO, he is the CEO. And because of that, they make real technology advanced stuff. And, and so that's what I would do if I was a, a CEO. I would make my CIO um, my COO or CEO. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I love some of these examples and I definitely appreciate that. Um, some of the conversations that I'm having, you know, on a frequent basis is within my network and maybe folks that I'm mentoring and it's all around, how do I get myself out there? How do I get exposed to a lot of these board opportunities? And for some of the less experienced individuals, it's more of like, okay, well, let me do the same as, as a regular job search. And I see some job board opportunities and I'll apply for them. My response to that is, you know, it very rarely, it rarely works from that perspective, because at least for me, the board opportunities that I was exposed to, or I got a chance to join the boards was all about, number one, delivering the value and the networking and putting myself in those environments where I can build those meaningful relationships first. And then they translate to further opportunities such as, you know, the boards and things like that. What, what, what recommendations do you have or perhaps maybe you, that you provide as part of the, you know, the services that your company offers when it comes to getting exposed to board opportunities or essentially expanding the cast or white, the net that you throw out there to be able to see what's out there, what are the different opportunities, maybe share some insight from that perspective? Yeah, well, short of teaching the class right now on this podcast, uh, I, I would say that the main thing is to tell everybody that you know that you want to be on a board, that that is par, like that's number one. 
because and and I used to I jokingly say this in the class that when I am in the ladies room and the woman hands me you know a tissue or Kleenex or whatever I tell her I want to be on a board the guy that parks my car my you know uh, in, in the parking lot I tell him you know I want to be on a board but seriously um, you know seventy percent seventy five percent of the opportunities come from networking comes from people that you know, people that heard about you, and only about 25% come from search firms. So search firms are important to have in your back pocket and to get to know them. I would, in, you know, they say you don't want to repair the roof when it's raining. You don't want to wait until you want a board job until you get to know these, these, uh, these search firms. Get to know Corn Ferry now, get to know Spencer Stewart now, find out, because they may have an opportunity for you in your current role. You know, if you're currently a CXO, they will be glad to talk with you about, because, you know, with everyone is quitting jobs, you know, we're going other places. And so they may find you very interesting for a current role, right, that they may be uh, scouring the landscape for, but then get to know them and ask them as well about uh, board placement, board opportunities. Uh, I've I even asked some of my board, my uh, search firm colleagues, can you interview me? Pretend, take a, take an old board search out, you know, out of your file. That's three years old, five years old, whatever. And then, you know, if it fits my, my, uh, my skill, interview me, pretend that I'm a real candidate. Give me feedback on how I interviewed for that opportunity. And so even though only 25% of the opportunities come from search firms, they could really help you be really smart sounding and, and uh, really good. But tell everybody that you know that you want to be on a board and 75% of those opportunities will come through um, relationships. That's a great insight, uh, especially on the search firm perspective. And you've mentioned interviewing. And it's, a, it's an area that I, I'm very interested in, mainly because I've been on all different sides of the equation from the interview perspective as a job seeker, as a candidate, as a hiring manager when I was interviewing and also part of the search firm where I help, you know, candidates and hiring organizations find that match. And one of the themes that I'm always encountering is that interviews are flawed in the sense that there's too much emphasis on what are the weaknesses that I can tolerate in that particular candidate versus what are the strengths that I'm missing on my team and can that candidate fill that void? And not a lot of interviews are structured as that two-way conversation where both the candidate also gets an opportunity to vet the, is this the right leader for me to succeed under? Is this the right environment? Share your thoughts on improving that space or share your thoughts on maybe some of the strategies that you provide to folks that you work with when it comes to interviews, how structuring, and maybe some of the questions that you personally like to ask the candidates and what are the, what do you look for in the responses when you hear them? Well, it depends. Are you referring to just a general manager that's, that's looking to hire a leader in a business or what kind of interview are we talking about? Uh, we, let's start there. Uh, and maybe we could transition more to the board opportunities as the interviews are structured from that perspective. Okay. Well, I think from a manager standpoint, um, the managers has to know what they want. I've seen so many people that have been brought in or has been asked questions about their ability to drive cultural change, but then they come in and they're like the only one that's trying to drive cultural change. And, and so I say the audio must always match the video. If there's something that a manager is telling a candidate it must be real. It must be happening back at the office, if you will. A single person cannot come in and, and change the culture. So that is a top down and it's also a bottoms up situation. When I'm looking for candidates, at least when I was, I'm not, uh, my, my candidates are experienced board members for my company. So I have a different scenario. But when I was looking for, for candidates, I did not just look at the experience uh, and the strengths and weaknesses per se. I looked at three things, head, heart and guts. I, and, and I believe that no matter what the experience was, if their foundational, uh, their foundational, how they, how they behave in their head, how they behave in their heart and how they behave in their guts, then I can teach them my business. I can teach them, you know, other things about the business. So your head, I, is that person results oriented, right? Does that person know how to prioritize really well? Is that person strategic? Does that person have a great business acumen? Do they understand about how businesses work and they understand the strategy around businesses from a global standpoint, domestic standpoint, 
if they're working with the government, whatever that business happens to be. And then the heart, the heart is, do I have someone that has empathy? Do I have someone that cares about not only uh, themselves, but the customer cares about suppliers, cares about the environment, cares about uh, the community, uh, cares about the employees? Do they know how to collaborate horizontally? Many people are so used to this hierarchical, you know, I can only talk to you know, the person above me or whatever, and, and, and I have to obey them as opposed to being that leader that already has a great mindset. And so having someone that knows how to horizontally collaborate, uh, you know, but what I call busting silos or working through the individual silos that do exist in businesses, who can, can cut across? And then guts, being able to deal with ambiguity. Not everything is black and white. There are times when you can find the answer in the gray, uh, having driving innovation. Do I have someone that is willing to do hackathons and, and is willing to solve a problem across the organization that has to do with you know, innovation, exploiting or you know, exploring um, you know, new innovative ideas, integrity. Uh, can they move from this organization to that organization? So that is what I look for in people uh, that are that we that I used to you know interview when I was back in in the organization. And then the strengths and weaknesses will come out in the conversation. But what am I looking for? And we got to be really clear on that. Today, from the candidate standpoint, so just doing the opposite, it's the it's what I call a persona based interview. Who am I talking to? You know, they're humans. So they went to college. Where did they go to college? Do I know anybody that went to college with them? Um, and so, you know, know who you're talking to and understand what questions they may have of you. If you're talking to the head of manufacturing, that person may have a different set of questions than the CFO, right? And so knowing who you're talking to, that persona-based interview will come into play and you'll be prepared to say, now I'm talking to the head of manufacturing. They may get into what I've done with supply and demand, you know, forecasting, touchless manufacturing, you know, uh, design for design for for 3D uh, printing. You know, how will they approach me? They'll approach me differently than a CFO who will be looking at margins and and uh, and uh, cash conversion cycles, right? And so know know that, and then know why you're interested in the opportunity, and know the value in your superpower. Everyone's got one. If the one thing I think people lack is the either the the ability or the desire to speak to their superpower, because we're we're taught to be humble, we're taught to be quiet about our strengths, and let 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 your let your actions speak for you. Talk about your superpower and how you can give that superpower to the company to help that company thrive. And so those are the two kinds of ways that I go about the interview process as a candidate or as a as a hiring person. I love it. I love it. It's definitely a masterclass that you had put on from a perspective of a very com complex phase of any talent acquisition process because interviewing is very subjective as well from mm -hmm. a perspective of how do you structure that. So I, I loved all of the examples that you had provided. So thank you for that. Shifting gears a little bit more onto, onto you as, a, as an individual, um, share with us your content diets uh, these days. What are the different sources that you consume on a daily basis that lets you keep, you know, stay informed, stay ahead of the curve in terms of yeah. the industry that you're operating? So I'm always fascinated with the strategies of people, how to keep your mind, you know, selective, you know, very selective in terms of what do you let, you know, exposure to. So just share with us some of the some of those channels. Yeah, we do, we deal with uh, Jan the fear of missing out, and I can't tell you the number of things that come to my inbox that I just try to resist. I can't read everything, and so I try to be selective. So there are some that that I have as my favorites that I read almost every day. Obviously, the New York Times uh, comes in, and, and whatever newspaper, whether it's Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Uh, is is a, is a given. I read medium, and and I do believe in seeing around the corner. You know, I believe that my job as a board member is to be able to do that reading that my management team can't, right? Because they're busy running the company every day, and they're looking at the detailed reports, and they're managing their people's performance appraisals, and you know, on and on and on and on. And so I so things like medium. Um, I'm on the I, I'm on a member of what is called the National Association of Corporate Directors, which is NACD. 
every day something comes out about, you know, whether it's Spirit Airlines and Frontier, you know, trying to merge or whatever the different things are happening in industry. I go to the, to the NACD daily that gives you everything that's coming out that has to do with any company, you know, in, in the United States, at least. Uh, there's something called the CEO Daily. There's uh, it, it talks about what are CEOs thinking about. So interviews with Mark Andreessen or, or you know, the CEO of, of IBM or, or whoever is, uh, is, is going on. So now you hear about the, the, the industry's uh, CEOs and what's on their minds, right? The, the new CEO of Walgreens and, uh, and the Shunda from the other company. And so what are they saying? What are women CEOs saying? How are they getting paid? Uh, what are some of the challenges that they're dealing with? Uh, MIT and McKinsey are two more that I, I get stuff from almost every day or at least every week for sure. Um, I'm on the, the Accenture Cybersecurity Council. And so once a month, once every three weeks, we meet and we talk about the latest things that we need to worry about and take back to our companies uh, about what's happening with cybersecurity and how do you look at cybersecurity in, in new ways um, than, than historically. And then finally, I'd say Digital Director Network, you know, um, Bill, uh, Bob Zukas is a really great guy. He uh, He's helping every board member become a digital board member and uh, which is important as you look at all the threats of architecture, data, cyber, uh, just complexities that are existing. How do we look at uh, technology in new ways. So I almost every week I am reading all of those things. Those are exceptional. And I, I appreciate you being very generous with actually naming those sources versus just some of the strategies. So definitely that helps a lot. And we'll put some of the links in the show notes as well for others if they're very interested in that. Um, I have a loaded question for you. Okay. And it goes along the ways of maybe an advice or series of advice that you had received early in your career when you were just starting out that perhaps you still refer back to even these days and maybe that you use to mentor others. Maybe it doesn't need to be anything specific, but within the lines of what are some of those words of wisdom that you, you continuously share with others even to this day? Sure, I would say, um, I'll say wait, W-A-I-T is one, I'll get into that, what that means. And then I would say um, TAR, T-A-R. No, no, I'll do PIE, P-I-E. All right, so wait and PIE. <laughs> you're, the, you're, the, you're the queen of acronyms, I, I love I know, <laughs> I know. And you know, I got five Fs and three Ps and you know, I'm, I'm into, you know, how do you, part of one of my superpowers, I make the complex simple, right? That's and awesome. I, I may make it too simple. People say, oh, I can do that. <laughs> she made it, she did, she did it in two, two days or two, two minutes. And so then they realized, oh, this took 20 years. So um, well, yes. not to interrupt you, uh, an idea came to my mind that we should do an executive webinar with one of my professors at Harvard was, he's very well known throughout the world as he's a finance professor. Uh, but what he does is he's very famous for breaking down very complex financial terminology and concepts into like a three-year-old would understand, which yeah. I'm actually experiencing a lot with you right now with all the metaphors that you're using. So that's, <laughs> that's exceptional. It is a superpower. <laughs> all right. Thank you. So wait is the first one. I remember when I was in, uh, I was actually, uh, I was not a corporate officer. I don't think at the time, but I was, I was a vice president still. And I found myself, I'm a very inclusive communicator. I just like to tell you, like you said, I gave you all the details about every, you know, thing that I, that I listened to and read. Um, and so he found that I was doing too much talking. So he says, Daphne, every time you want to say something, you should W-A-I-T. And I said, wait, okay, I'll wait. What am I waiting for? And he said, wait stands for why am I talking? Why am I talking? Sometimes you want to be that loudest horn in the, in the room. You want everybody to know that you are the smartest person in the room. But the question is, is it necessary? Does it improve on the silence that it's interrupting? And will somebody learn something as a result of it? And so those are the three things I had to say to myself before I wanna go into the spewing off at the mouth, just wait. 
And I would find people that do the opposite as well. Some, so I've, I've coached people, um, you know, if you're, if you're an extrovert, you probably only want to maybe say uh, three things in the course of an hour, maybe only two in the course of an hour. But then you'll find people who are introverts who don't say a word. And then people wonder, well, why are they in this meeting? They haven't said anything. And so to those introverts that I coach, I, I say to them, you want to at least speak three times in the meeting. One is an observation, two is a question, and number three is a recommendation. That way they know you're listening because you made an observation. They know that you're doing some critical thinking because you're asking a question about what somebody said. And they know that you have value to add because you are making a recommendation. And so you don't get asked anymore, well, why are they in the room? So those are the things that I would talk about when you're in a conversation, in a group of people, speak, but then also wait. Oh, that's the super. Other, <laughs> the other thing is, is pie. Pie was a game changer for me when I was, where was I? I was at Johnson and Johnson. So that was like in year 2000 or so. And, um, I heard about this man named Harvey Coleman and Harvey Coleman created this concept called pie. So I didn't make it up, but I tell everybody that I know about it. When you are in, in corporate America or any organization, the first thing you got to do is perform. That's what the P stands for. You have to perform. You got to, you know, deliver early, deliver under budget. Um, when something was just going to be this big, you found a way to expand it and make it be bigger, and, and but you didn't blow a budget doing it. So you performed really, really well. That's important, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient to be promoted and to have a career that is really, that's high performing. The second letter is I. The second letter in, in pi is I. And that I stands for your image. Your image is your brand. When somebody knows that, that John is coming to a meeting, do they say, oh my God, here we go again. He's always complaining. He's never on time. He's very selfish. Or do they say, oh my goodness, he is one of the most creative guys I know. He's very giving. He collaborates so well. And every time Jan comes to a meeting, we are going to get a lot of stuff done. We, I, I, wish, I wish he'd come here now early. I wish he'd come earlier than, because he is so great. So your image is what precedes you when, when people are, you know, if you're not in the room or not on Zoom, what are they saying about you? Are they saying good things? Or are they saying not so good things? And your goal is to make sure that they say the, the great things because your image is, is that way. Um, and then the third is E. Your E is your exposure. Who knows you and who do you know? If there is someone that is your mentor, your sponsor, there are people that, that promote you. You don't promote yourself. There are people that will expend their political capital or their, their relational capital in the corporation. And they will, if they're exposed to you, they will say, well, there's that opportunity in Germany. Why can't we send Daphne? She's got this experience. She speaks German. She's been doing this for four years. So if you don't have that exposure, to that person or, the, or to, to the right people, you will never be considered for that opportunity. So if you are considered and you have that exposure and you have a great brand and you perform really well, your, your career will take off uh, more likely than not. So those are the two things that I wish I had told my younger self when I was 20 years old as opposed to uh, when I was 45 or 50 years old. Oh, that's super cool. I, I was actually seriously taking notes on some of the acronyms. I, I love stuff like this. So definitely mm -hmm. going to share that with our listeners in the show notes as well. Those are very powerful. Daphne, last but not least, share with us, uh, what are you currently reading uh, in terms of a book? Or is there a book that you always recommend to others? And why is that? Well, yes, yeah, two different things in a way. One is I'm reading about the Phoenix Project. Um, the Phoenix Project is, um, it's a fictitious company. You know, there's always this clash between ops and dev, dev and ops, dev and ops. When you develop something, how are you going to maintain it? Or if you make a change to something, how are you going to cascade that uh, in, your, in your operations? And then between the two dev ops conflicts, then there's a conflict with your line of business. They want something done tomorrow, even though they didn't put the, the right resources into it. So the Phoenix Project is a fictitious IT 
uh, problem that have people have. So it's just something to help my CIOs because as a board member, my superpower, certainly I understand manufacturing and, and, and commercial, but I also am an IT person as well. And so I'm reading this book so I can understand how my CIOs in my board companies are doing and how they can be even better um, as they connect with the business. So uh, that's one. I think, uh, boy, um, besides Harvey Coleman, Pi, and uh, I'm reading another book by Shelley Archibald, who I highly recommend. It's called Un Unapologetically Ambitious. Shelley was one of the first female African-American CEOs in Silicon Valley. And she is, is sort of like a, it's like having your own mentor in your pocket or your own mentor in your hand, because she talks about how do you win and have success on your own terms. Financial literacy, a lot of people don't understand about how to be financially literate, as you're talking about your professor that tries to break it down. Uh, making sure that you take care of your network, making sure that you have a reputation that is good. How do you take care of yourself, your family, your, your spouse, your children, your health, and things like that. And so it's a book that really guides you and makes you know about the basics of how to succeed because you usually think about just working, 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 and you don't really know that there's things you also have to do to prepare yourself to be great. And, and it's not just showing up for work every day and turning on your, your, your laptop and going to work. It's about how do you take risks? How do you, how do you have show tenacity? How do you show courage? And, and while you're doing all those things, how do you develop yourself in order to, uh, to be able to win? And uh, I'll say this one last thing. There's a book that is coming out uh, and, it's, and it's the written by me. So I would say that'll be the best book ever. And that best book ever is the, the name of the book is Win When They Say You Won't. And that is a book that I wrote and is being published by McGraw-Hill. And it will be out November 8th, Win When They Say You Won't. And this is a book that is geared to people in their mid-careers, a little bit, maybe a little bit later in their career. But when people have told you that you would never win, because I've been told by my, my teachers, by bosses, and I've been shown by example that people who look like me and that are female don't always get the, uh, the opportunities to win. And so I give you them a four-step strategy on how do you win? How do you take the same approach that software developers take in creating a new version of software? How can you create a new version of yourself so that you can win when others say you won't? Well, I love it. Well, it's a definitely a great segue to plan the next episode when the actual book comes out so we can <laughs> dive a little bit deeper into some of the strategies that you cover in that. So that's super exciting and congratulations on all that success because I know what it takes to publish a book and it's it's not an easy feat. And the fact that it's coming out so soon, I, I think it's, uh, it's just... It's just very exciting time. So I'm definitely looking forward to discussing that with you. Thank and you. Daphne, with just like with you know, with few guests on the on the show, what I love doing is a follow-up recording in about a year we'll, because we revisit the conversation from a year ago and Ooh. listen to everything that we've discussed and see if everything still makes sense, still applies. So I'm definitely looking forward to doing that with you as well. And I'm very thankful for your time today. Thank you. It's my pleasure and my honor to be with you today. <laughs>